Hey everybody, it's Laura King. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's Laura Kingen. <laughs> Thank you so much, that's really lovely. Um, this is like really my first presentation to be able to do this other than my live videos and to do this for halfway around the world. It's to share this information really around, halfway around the world and back around again um, is really tremendous to me because I've been doing this for 40 years and I have found the sensory systems are so important, especially for people with autism, but it's it's that sensory processing. It's so simple um, and so basic, and yet it's so profound the implications. Um, so I'm sure there's lots of families out there with different levels of knowledge about um, sensory processing. Um, but when we work with people with autism, when you look at them and watch them, uh, Mama Josie, I imagine with your your son you can see the different kinds of sensory mechanisms, um, whether they're doing a lot of movement or there's the visual, they get overwhelmed or uh, the sound is too much. Um, there's so much information that we could cover in like, and try to do this in 30 minutes. Um, so I've, I, we've narrowed this down to sensory diet tips. Um, and I'm gonna talk in a general way but to give you all some ideas, because I think one of the most important things is to make it individual. Everybody is unique. Um, and if we say, okay, this is the way that you're supposed to do it, <laughs> it's not gonna work. Uh, and that's where the OT perspective comes in. We do evaluations and we look at each person individually. Um, and then we come up with a plan and that's called the treatment plan. Um, but um, the term sensory diet is really a very general term, but it's looking at the sensory mechanisms and how to incorporate these, the, our basic senses into a regular day-to-day -day routine to help address those sensory needs because the sensory issues are primary. And um, unfortunately, I did not see your presentation last week, but I did hear teacher Anna uh, talk a couple of weeks ago. And I believe, you know, about behavior, I think was last week. Teacher Anna sounded like she was speaking like out of my mouth. Because <laughs> yeah. even though she's halfway around the world, we're talking about the same kinds of things. And how if the sensory needs go unmet, it can cause a lot of the behavior issues. But if the sensory needs, needs are met, we can incorporate academics and chores and activities of daily living skills. So what I wanna do in 30 minutes and less um, is cover uh, several different kinds of things. Um, I draw, I've worked with the Native Americans for, for a long time and there's a Native American medicine wheel and if you, any of you have heard about that. And I'm gonna, keep it very simple. And I wanna talk about four different areas, um, the mental, emotional, the physical, and then the social, spiritual, and how each one of those four components um, uh, have, uh, there should be balance with those four areas. Um, so I wanna talk about some of these, uh, some mental concepts, emotional, the social, and then the physical. And while we talk about the sensory arena, I'm gonna come back full circle and finish up with that part. Um, because I wanna talk about sensory diet um, tips for you all, for you parents out there um, on what you can do at home to address these sensory needs. Um, I've done a lot of video and in the last month, I've been addressing hyperactivity and hypoactivity and aggression. And so those videos you can find, um, uh, it's like each video takes a particular topic. So tonight I wanna to talk about sensory diet tips. So let's talk about some mental things to consider when we talk about sensory diet. And what I mean by that is there should be some kind of plan every day um, for your 
child or for the person that you're giving care to based on their particular needs um, there should be it should be organized there should be a routine um, whenever I'm asked to look at a sensory diet for somebody I want to know what their schedule is I want to know what their routine is um, and I talk a lot about self-regulation and in our day for all of us we kind of start out slow and then we kind of do something, we get busy and then we wanna calm back down again. But a lot of times kids with sensory processing issues are unable to um, regulate their, their own selves. And even when it, even just emotionally, it's the same concept that we kind of, we have an emotion and we get excited about it and then we kind of calm back down. But if we don't have that ability to calm ourselves back down, um, uh, we can either have behavior problems or we get distracted or there can be all kinds of maladaptive kinds of issues. So as a therapist or as a parent or a caregiver, we want to help calm back down. And so in our daily routine, we want to have these like peaks and valleys where we have activities where we get busy, but then we want to calm back down. Um, and I'm probably talking more for hyperactive, um, where they tend to get, they spike really high. And yet for somebody who's hypoactive, you always want to kind of give them a stimulation where they um, kind of pick up that pace. And so in our day, we want to know the peaks and valleys. And like, for example, if I'm going to work with somebody who is going to have math, say, at 11 o'clock in the morning, and it's a really hard subject. I don't want to do a lot of anxiety, high stress activities before they do math. I want them to go into the harder subject, calm, because I know if math is going to be hard for them, they're going to have more stress during that session. So we want to start calm. They can have the math and, and have the anxiety and then calm back down. So oh. when we... actually, this is my first time to hear that, that said that I mean, routine is very important when it comes to the sensory uh, issues of our kids. And I really like this, that we, that you're saying that it, we really need to know where this, the calm, calm time <laughs> for those things. And when we talk about sensory diet, to know what the schedule is. And one of the other, uh, I'm kind of jumping ahead to knowing what the family and the people around in the household, what the needs are for everybody that you wanna have, um, uh, you wanna pay attention to all of that. Like the, earlier I talked about uh, in my demo today about what's going on around you um, and to pay attention to that and how that can contribute to overstimulation. And if Let's say, for example, dad goes to work at a particular time and that's a stressful time or it's a pleasant time um, that that we want to work with all of those different kinds of things throughout the day and we want to structure it accordingly. So if it's something exciting that there's going to be a high arousal level, then we know that we want to structure something where it's calmer after that. So. So we have these peaks and valleys so that they can get excited, but calm back down, get excited, calm back down. So that's one of the considerations is what's going on in, in the day-to-day, hour-by-hour routine. And, and know that there are gonna be some things where you're gonna get excited, then calm back down, as opposed to, we're gonna like, as opposed to building on high stimulating activities where it's math and then it's these other activities that are harder where it's like the stress builds throughout the day and there's no way to calm back down. There's no way to take a, a deep breath. <laughs> and I, I grew up in New York, so I tend to like go, 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 go. So this, there's a reason why I have to, I'm teaching this because I need to like, consciously calm myself down. And even as an adult doing this for so many years, there's a reason why I'm still having to like get my own self ready so that we, so that I know to calm back down.
take some deep breaths, and then I can start into the next activity. So having structure and routine and the predictability um, is just so important. Um, you know what, teacher Laura, um, I, I really like when, when it comes to this concept that, concept that timing is very important. You know, there is a question that's usually being asked, by, especially for those early um, diagnosed parents. Um, their, their question is always this, that their kids is just around two to three, four years old. And are they, is, they are asking, if is it okay to have uh, a class of uh, two to three hours consecutively for, for those very little, I mean, young age? Is that okay for them to have like that, like therapy class or I don't know, there are classes like that. My response to that is why not? But it depends on what is being structured within that time. And if they're two and three years old and being asked to sit at a desk for two and three hours, <laughs> two and two year olds do not sit down. Yeah. If you have some structured physical, I mean, think about what a two-year-old does. Two and three-year-olds, what they're doing is they're doing a lot of moving around. They're exploring their senses. So if there's structured and unstructured activities that's develop, meeting their developmental needs at that level, then I think, yes, that could be, I think that that could be appropriate. But if they're being asked to do things that they're not developmentally ready for, then it's going to be a setup for failure. So I think it depends on, on what is being structured in that two and three hours. It's a lot of time. Yeah. So it depends on how it's structured. I think it could work and, and otherwise maybe not. And if the kids is ready, actually. Right. Yeah, that's right. And a two-year-old may still be very attached to mom or dad. And, um, and in that two and three year Actually, from an emotional standpoint, a two-year-old is still very attached to mom and may not be re uh, emotionally ready to have a lot of separation from mom. And at that two and a half or so, um, those of you that have had children, um, do you notice that your child, they'll like go off and do their own thing and then they come back and they go off and then they come back. And so if they're away from mom for too long, that might be emotionally challenging, especially if they're already um, a little immature for their age. Um, so I think theoretically it could work, but it's a very individual thing. And, and you would have to assess that for each person. So that's my response to that. Um, This is the thing is, how, how do we talk about sensory diet tips in 30 minutes? <laughs> it's like, there's a lot of things to cover. And so I just wanted to like, uh, just kind of cover some very general things. And then I know that we can have lots of questions um, and we can even talk about, that's actually kind of how I want to finish up, plant a seed about how I want to finish, finish up, is what are, your, what are the parents' needs? And, um, you know, we're doing, the, uh, I'm offering a lot of free, free videos but what are the parents, what are your needs? What do you all need? Um, and as we're really shifting socially um, and how I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one hands-on anymore. And it is about teaching parents, teaching you all who are working with your, your children, what do you do? Um, and that's why we're having, that's why I'm going more to an educational perspective where I can share in more of a group, some of these different ideas, and to give some, give you all some ideas to go ahead and, and experience, uh, to practice and experiment with, and then come back and you know what worked and what didn't. Um, I'm trying to offer uh, some some sensory therapy groups where parents come together and we talk about these kinds of things. What are some of your issues? Like um, the aggression. That's why I did the video on aggression um, because I was noticing a lot of the comments are about aggression um a lot of comments yes uh, hitting, 
a lot of questions and posts on meltdowns, tantrums. Actually, there's a lot. But I think one of the issues that we really need to address with the parents is their confidence. Because some of them, they, they think that um, this limited, lim very limiting uh, time that we have, uh, we cannot go face to face and most of them they are in a remote place they don't right. have really the confidence if can they really help their kids is that really possible yeah. so what can you say about that well and and uh i could say a whole lot <laughs> um and i think it's a judgment call and some of it is i think about trusting mom's gut um and yet where does therapy come in and is therapy this really sophisticated, high tech kind of thing? And when we talk about sensory mechanisms, it's really pretty basic. Um, you know, looking at your child from a sensory standpoint, and what are they? What is the behavior saying from a sensory standpoint? And to shift the perspective from uh, to looking at what's going on visually, auditory with sound, smell, taste, and touch. And then we want to throw in movement, thinking about all those different kinds of things. If a child is very aggressive and is hitting a lot, then maybe they need to do more physical, deep pressure oriented activities like the exercise balls, crash pads, cushions, and doing a lot of pounding. Like it's all, it's like, I want to exaggerate the sensory input that um, the child may be exhibiting. So watch your child, if they're doing a lot of hitting and pounding and punching, then maybe just give them activities where they can punch and pound, but giving the adult guidance around some boundaries about that, some very basic common sense things. If they are being safe, is it really a problem? Um, uh, where do I want to go with that? I think safety is um, kind of like that demarcation. There was a comment on one of the threads earlier um, about you know hair pulling, and if a, if a child is pulling a parent's hair, that to me is crossed. They've crossed the line. And I think with the sensory mechanisms, it's like there's two different things. It's either um, you need to manage it or prevent it. Once you have an outburst like the aggression, you have to then manage that behavior. And what we're trying to do is that is we're trying to prevent, um, we're trying to prevent these different behaviors. So I can understand, especially like, it's like all of a sudden I'm almost 60. It's like, how did that happen? You know, and I'm seeing a lot of these young parents. They, for me, it seems very young. <laughs> So I can understand that there probably is some confidence issues, especially very young. And so I think a good therapist um, is to help work with the families so that you all can take these different ideas and then apply them at home. And then you go back to the therapist and you work with the therapist and problem solve. This is what worked, this didn't. Um, and in the, in the clinic, in the, in the actual clinic, um, I think historically the therapist works one-on-one, -on -one, but I think it's best when, like I, the last 17 years I was going into people's homes and working with parents and just doing some trial and error, try this. But thinking about some basic concepts, keeping it structured, keeping routines, what's going on with the other family members. If, if, if a sibling has a music lesson at four o'clock every day, then it just makes sense that there's probably going to be higher stimulation in the household, and that you know, how to watch the child, watch your child, and does your child tend to get hyper during that time? Then do something that's calmer, and that would be part of that routine, and to take that those kinds of things into consideration. So I don't know if that helps with regards to confidence. <laughs> yeah, I think that is the very reason why parents are one of the best help that are, uh, the, their kids can ever have because they know who the, they know the routines they know the condition of their kids they know when when is the best timing to do things um and, and here's another example is like say like at two o'clock in the afternoon you know your child is tired 
that is not a good time for them to do the math if that's like the hard subject <laughs> they will cry <laughs> it's it's a setup it's it's really a setup that you know that they tend to be tired at that point so let that let that be a time where where it's more of a quiet time that their nat their natural rhythms are calmer at two o'clock so don't place a lot of demands and it's like even as a therapist and i think this is true for parents is we it's like here we want you to do this as opposed to okay i want you to do this but what are you giving me back in return and is that really a realistic expectation um that we have to take into consideration the individual too okay um Actually, there's a question here from Mom, Mommy Marilu Kibuyan. Hello, Mommy Marilu. Long time no here. Uh, good morning, Laura. Can you provide Can you provide to us a sample of sensory diet to reduce their sensory issues like playing with saliva and hurting, especially if he is not understood? That's from Mari, Mommy Marilu. Hi, Mommy Kathy. Good morning. So, well, you know, I, I think I'm going to do a demo on ADLs on activities of daily living skills that has to do with hair cutting and nail trimming and the saliva. Um, those are kind of hard areas that I'm seeing a lot of commentary on the threads and that I've worked with. Um, and they're not necessarily the easiest, um, like the hair cutting on a comment on that. I worked with somebody for about two years. It took a while, yeah. um, but he was successful. The thing about the saliva, I got a couple of comments about that, but it, I think it's a hard one um, because there's something about kids with autism and their bodily issues that the the um, uh, the fluids that come out, the nails, the hair, it's part of our body. And it's an odd concept for them. And I don't know if they like to get rid of that. I don't think they understand that. And yet some of that can be fascinating that I think some of the saliva, they get into it and they kind of stim on it. Like, what is this about? Um, so that's kind of hard to address because I think it's an emotional kind of a, an issue. But there is something about oral motor stimulation and developmentally um, very early, you know, say two years old um, and earlier where they're putting things, kids are putting things in their mouth. There's a lot. And yes, and we grow through, like I take a developmental perspective um, in, in my therapy and where is somebody functioning at on that developmental spectrum. And we go through this phase where we put things into our mouth and we explore. And I think a lot of times kids uh, have yet to grow through that developmental stage real well. So they're constantly putting things in their mouth. And that's where the chew toys come in. Um, and so I think that, that <laughs> the and the nuke brushes, um, that would be, something I would, it's a general recommendation, but I think with the saliva and all, I would encourage you to maybe talk to a therapist about it, about the individual uh, needs for you. But a general approach would be, I wanna give more oral motor stimulation to try to help work, help that child work through the developmental stage so that they can get past that need to constantly put things in their mouth. So again, I wanna exaggerate. I may wanna do some massage or some deep, uh, some light touch. I may want to go in the mouth and do that as part of the routine. Keep that as part of the regular routine so that that becomes satiated. Because I think so much of this, kids are needing the sensory input. Somehow the sensory mechanisms in the brain have been interrupted or it takes extra effort to open up the pathways in the brain. So we're really trying to exaggerate the basic um, sensory stimulation. So same thing with the, with the mouth, the touch, um, doing different tastes and trying to wake that up and explore that. Um, and then seeing what your child responds back. Um, um, does it also affect their speaking? That's why some of them, they can't really speak well. 
Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yep. Yep. And so does the person with saliva have some communication, expressive language communication? Because receptive language is very different than expressive language. And we tend to clump that up um, as one whole thing, language skills. But understanding is very different than being able to express out. So a lot of kids have better expressive language. And I think like I was talking about the biting of the hand. Um, I think that that's, that's I think, so much of the frustration with the lack of communication, because I think a lot of those kids can understand, but then they have trouble getting it out. That's why they bite um, their, hand, their hands. I think that's, I think it's frustration. I think it's communication a lot of the times with the biting. And it is sensory in nature, in nature as well, you know. Oh, because I have met a lot, I mean, a couple of kids doing that. Okay, either happy or happy or sad. <laughs> frustrated or happy excited it's the same thing they still bite their their hands right and once they start doing it it's really hard to get them to stop and i i wonder if some of it is also self-regulatory uh, or and habit you know they get into the habit of doing that and somehow it kind of helps regulate them in some way and they keep doing it and it it, it becomes habit and i've worked with kids with scarred hands and that's yeah. hard they're, and, they already have black um, things in their hands. Yes. And so um, in talking about the different, the different senses is really doing a lot of touch. Um, I'll talk about brushing where you take a brush and you brush, you know, your, your uh, skin and you can brush around your mouth. And that would be part of the regular routine um, to, to help satiate those needs. Oh. It's really meeting the needs, the sensory needs. We really need to meet them. Yes. And, and again, especially with autism, so much of it is really exaggerate. Because if you look at their behaviors and their interests and values, so much of it is sensory in nature. It has to do either with giving themselves visual input, auditory input, touch input, or movement that constant movement. And we talk about the five senses, but that does not cover movement. And a lot of that hyperactivity is trying to get the movement. And so I come in as a last resort therapist a lot of time because these sensory issues a lot of times haven't been addressed. And I'm talking over 40 years where, you know, I'd like to see the sensory um, uh, area be looked at because I think it can be very dare I say simple, um, it's a simple concept, but, but implementing it can be really difficult. Yes, because most of the times uh, parents look at these things are um, as behavior more than sensory. Yeah. And uh, yes, and I don't, because I hear a lot about ABA and I've honestly never really worked with many people with ABA. Um, it's just been kind of in passing. So I don't have a lot of commentary about that. And I'm seeing that a lot of people are not responding well to the ABA. There's a lot of controversy about it, but I'm coming from the sensory perspective. And if the sensory needs are being met, then the behavior should drop. And I have been called a last resort therapist because other things have, not, have it's like aren't being fully addressed. And then I come in and look at the sensory perspective and it really covers a lot of territory. And when those sensory needs can be met, especially when you look at it from a developmental perspective, that if they're not able to do this skill, but you're asking them to do something that's like two years post that, it's a setup for failure. So it's sensory, but it's also developmental and looking and, and, and wanting success. And I think with the sensory arena, um, it's, it's more general and you can be a little sillier and a little more freedom of spirit rather than being so exacting where, you know, the perspective of sitting somebody down at a desk and, and, and really insisting on doing this academic work, they may not be ready. And yet you can do a lot of the academic work through the sensory arena. I can put somebody in a swing that has a, has a cushion and I can give them a book or I can have a blackboard and we can do all kinds of academics that incorporate the sensory mechanisms. 
So it's not like I'm just going to do swinging. The art of therapy is how much you can put into one activity. So use these different sensory systems as a foundation of which you can then build. Um, and those two and three-year-olds, what do two and three-year-olds do? They like to move around and crawl around on the floor. And that should be a part, a lot of what their routine is, is incorporating a lot of movement and touch and gooeyness. And there, I have a Facebook friend and his daughter is, I think, two and a half. And she's planting plants and cooking. She's put, helping to make pancakes in the morning. You know, I don't think she's any older than three years old. And she can contribute to those family tasks, but at a level that she's capable of. Um, so as far as, I mean, that gets more complicated when we talk about sensory diet, that gets into more of the finesse. Um, and really where I'm coming from with sensory diet is just making sure that if your child needs a lot of movement to make sure the movement gets into that, into their daily schedule, if they need a lot of touch, then there should be a lot of touch in the daily schedule. And then and then keeping in mind what is going on throughout the household and other families' needs, like your son um, needing to eat before this presentation, yeah. you know? And so, so knowing what the schedule is and incorporating the sensory mechanisms throughout and how the sensory activities can either be excitatory or calming and using that um, to help meet your needs. And again, going back to the math, that the math is hard. So knowing that that's a high stress, you wanna go slow into math so that it can build and then come back down. So I've already kind of repeated that concept. So a lot of these things that's going on with our kids is we really need to meet their needs first <laughs> before we can really ask them to do something, right? Like mm -hmm. what you have said before we go into this uh, Facebook Live, I have to cook lunch for my, my son. Because if we don't do that and he's, go, he's hungry, he's going to keep on knocking on my door right now. But it's really true. We really need to meet their needs, whether it's sensory or physical needs or emotional needs, touching needs. A lot of those things, they really need, in parents, we really need to meet those needs so we can really connect <laughs> i mean connect with them right teacher teacher laura and then once you know what their needs are to come up with a plan and that plan is the sensory diet and then you implement it every day whatever that plan looks like try to implement that the same way every time and that and as a result then those child's needs should be met as well as the other people in the household um it's it's hard to cover in half an hour um but it's really, it can be incredibly helpful. And it's not just the autistic, the person with the autism, but it's the whole family that, that can be part of that plan. And if there's siblings, then, the, then there should be sibling time in part of that daily routine. That's part of the sensory diet. Okay. So, and I guess, again, to reiterate, what I've done is I now have all these different videos that talk about the tactile, that talk about proprioception, that talks about vestibular. I have a video on introduction to sensory play. Um, and how I've done it in my videos is kind of a classroom portion and, and a lab portion where I like to present some concepts and then actually do an activity. So in my, my videos, um, uh, like today I talked about overstimulation. Um, I did an activity that kind of channels some of that overstimulation, and then we do a comment. So um, I have a video. Uh, I just, this video that you're talking about is in your YouTube channel, right? You have a YouTube channel. Yes. Yeah. I, and there's lots of different videos that, and so it's like a 45 minutes on this topic, 45 minutes on this topic, 45 minutes on that topic. So I really do go much more into depth in these different areas. Um, I talk about there, I do a whole video just on sensory diet um, that goes even more into what we've got and talked about today. Um, so I do have references for parents that's free online available, uh, no obligation of any kind, but because it is something that I've studied for 40 years and I have seen a lot of success. It's just really important. And 
sometimes medication is needed, but, and I'm seeing how some parents are talking about, let's just go right to meds. And it's like, you can incorporate some activities into your day-to-day -day routine that can really help. And, and then maybe go to meds, but try these things first. I mean, meds is the last resort, right? I, and yet, and yet our medical system, that's what we kind of tend to do these days is, is just go reach for the, the drugs, the pills. But looking at the development, a, a two and a three-year-old child should be moving around on the floor and crawling around um, and not necessarily, a two-year-old should not be sitting at a desk and expected to write. They're not, a, a, a human being is not, shouldn't be doing a lot of writing at two. They should be doing a lot of manip uh, playing with manipulatives and and the sen very sensory oriented activities and maybe that's a reason why we have this lingering need for sensory input and not just for the kids but us adults as well. How many adults? My husband, he rocks sometimes. I have you ever noticed that? <laughs> it's regulatory. There's a regular that rhythmical rocking back and forth is it has a regulatory um, effect on us. And if we prevent our, if we prevent ourselves from doing that, then what do we do instead? We have these behaviors. It's true. My son will used to do this, like he will tap his breast. If he's happy, and most, most of the time he's happy, we'll do that. And I just let him, okay, because you're happy, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I think we really need to take, really ask ourselves, is it worth, is it worth um, trying to prevent them from doing that? And why would we want to prevent them from doing that? Yeah, I think more, you know, some of the question is, is really that, uh, am I going to stop my, my child from steaming? Yeah. And, and it may be the social part that you don't want your child to do that, but what could the consequences be? Is he going to become more distressed without being able to do that? I'm seeing some of these adult uh, people who are adults now with autism who can actually talk about their stimming. I, it's fascinating. Um, and that's something new uh, to see adults and adult uh, people with people, adults with autism who are now having children with uh, autism. And that's a whole new arena. Oh, I wonder how, how it is. But um, I, I just want to repeat that uh, no concept that that principle that steaming is also a sensory, I mean, sensory input. And it's a sensory regulation for them. It helps them. That's right. And so what you described, this behavior is very tactile. And so I would be, I would have a tendency if I were to work with your son or even be in the room with him to watch him, does he like a lot of tactile? And I may want to encourage more tactile activities for him um, to see if that might channel some of those needs for him so that, that maybe he doesn't need to do that quite so much, that he can express excitement without having to do that. If the tactile mechanism gets kind of satiated, you know, over time, if that makes any sense. Okay, because when he's excited, he really do that all the time. <laughs> yeah. And is there anything really wrong with that? Again, you know, the demarcation is, is he safe? And is that something he can be safe with? Now, some kids start to pick and pinch and that's not so much that I, that's, I would have a concern with because if they're picking so much where their skin becomes open, it, it could cause infections and that can be a safety issue. But if this like kind of tapping, is that really hurting him? Now, if he's really hitting so hard where he's bruising or banging his head, see, that's another behavior, head banging. And that's a common thing I've, I'm seeing people talk about. How much of that is frustration? communication and the need for touch. And so I would want to do a lot of maybe head massage 
Um, but that's where a multidisciplinary team team um, can come in handy because a lot oftentimes uh, it's a speech therapist um, would come in and, and offer the expertise in the communication, maybe a, a communication board, something like that. I don't know how common communication boards are around the world. And you can make communication boards, you know, on a piece of paper. Okay. You know, they can be simple. There's a question here. How can we address these sensory needs as parent of a growing 13-year-old boy that is non-verbal? And how can we reach you, Miss Laura? I think they are, they are asking for your YouTube channel, the name of your YouTube channel, where they can find find your videos. Yeah, it's the, my business is S is uh, Sensory Solutions Inc. So it's S S I Tube O T. S-S-I-T-U-B-E-O-T. -E um, so that's my YouTube channel. And um, uh, my Facebook is S-S-I-F-B. So Sensory Solutions um, uh, Facebook. And then, um, I'm sorry, the question about the 13-year-old. Yeah. Oh, about nonverbal. Um, again, I can just answer it very generally, but immediately what I want to say is what happens if, what happens when we get on a swing and we move? We, after a certain amount of time, we start laughing and ah, we make sound effects. There's something about the vestibular movement that seems to increase vocalizations. So while this, never really worked in practicality. I would have always loved to have done, uh, offered OT first and then have my client go and see speech therapy because I think the sensory mechanisms, especially movement, can really help wake up the brain so that the brain is more activated. So then to go into speech therapy where you can really do more the refinement of the speech or work with the speech therapist at the same time. So. I mean, depending if my child is even accepting of movement or what level of movement, you know, some people even a little movement and they're squealing. So I would really encourage a lot of movement. I think that could be really helpful and see what, do they start vocalizing a little more and making sounds um, or have the speech therapist with you so that like as the OT, I do the movement and the sensory stuff and the speech therapist then facilitates the, the, the speech. So that's how I want to answer that question. Okay. Um, for all the parents out there, I mean, how, what advice are you going to give for in the house? I mean, a very daily routine, simple routines for them, especially for the very hyper kids they have at home. The trick, I think, with, with the hyper activity is constantly bringing them back down because they're always so high is to do calming activities and determine what is the main mechanism to help him calm down. Is it more movement oriented? Is it more touch oriented? And I think all of us, adult, I'm talking about adults too. Um, do you have the propensity towards movement or towards touch? I mean, we all need both of those, um, but which one, uh, do you tend to respond better to? Um, and um, so with the hyperactivity, pick which one of those areas and then try to incorporate that into the day. So especially if you know, like say the morning routine, by the time the morning routine is over, they're really hyper, then calm them down. Do a calming activity maybe a rocking chair where they can rock. Um, or if they really are that hyper, then go ahead and get a, can you get a swing in your house or, or a ball or something where they can move um, and let them have that movement regularly. And keep in mind, whether it's back and forth or side to side, whether it's fast or slow, it doesn't matter, but rhythmical movement is calming. So, excuse me, and the deep pressure is coming for most people. A few people like the light touch, but most people don't. So I think you, with someone who's hyper, um, 
the trick is to oh is is to calm them back down and then you calm them back down and then it doesn't take much before they're spiked again right so calm them back down so know what the routine is in the in your home and work on the calming so that with the ultimate goal of self-regulation so that they can go ahead and start picking um, what what they know will calm them back down. I worked with a family who ended up put, they ended up having a therapy room and they had actually three hooks, therapy hooks. And eventually their son went into that therapy room. He got home from school and he would go in with the swing and he'd go in with the iPod and iPad and he would swing himself and he would calm himself down. Wow. And that's pretty independent functioning. I think I like that uh, therapy room because most of us, we don't really have that. I think most of the people, they they only have even an area <laughs> in their house because some, sometimes it's all, I mean, everything is there. The living room, kitchen, and all together in one place. Um, but uh, And that's why I've done... Yes. That's why I've done my demos at home because I, I'm at home too and you all are at home and I don't have a hook for my swing. Um, but what can we do? What are What is in your home that's available? And like with my couch, I mean, a lot of kids like to burrow into the couch. And honestly, I think if you can let them because they need that, they need such intense deep, that deep pressure is so important. So it ends up becoming a power struggle otherwise, because if you watch them so much of the time, they're telling you what they need. If they're bur burrowing themselves in the couch and have cushions on top, let them, they really need it. And the movement with, I've spent hours and hours and hours swinging kids that I think a lot of parents don't even think about a swing. And so that's part of the reason to even mention it. Um, because if you can, have some kind of swing or movement in your home, more than likely your child will really benefit. It'll really be worthwhile. And those exercise balls, they can be dangerous, but they're really worthwhile. You can really do a lot. Um, and I think with any of us, the more time and attention we, we just give one-on-one -on -one or small group goes a long ways. A lot of this, the kids are groping at trying to give themselves what they need. And by us acknowledging and honoring that need goes a long way. So just, it's to be creative with what you have yeah. and there's no judgment. It's more, the judgment is how creative can you be yes. in meeting your own child's needs, you know? Um, there's another also uh, usual, usual questions from parents is that, what are the sensory inputs that they can give to the, their kids for before going to bed so that they, their kids will sleep right away? <laughs> because most of them have sleep issues. And I'm assuming you're talking about more about the hyperactive children? Yeah. Or, um, so again, keeping these, these principles in mind and that that's part of the sensory diet is to be conscious about what you do for bedtime routines. Mm -hmm. So like br the brushing where you take a brush and you brush, that's to wake you up. And you would wanna do that more in the, the early part of the day. Um, lighter touch kinds of things earlier in the day for most people. The deep pressure calming at night. Um, at night, you know, the sun goes down, it's darker. If you have a lot of bright lights, that's gonna have the tendency to keep things highly stimulating. So thinking about our basic sensory systems and how, how are we gonna respond? If there's a lot of sound going on, it's gonna be more excitatory. So as we head into nighttime, lighting should get dimmer. Um, the sound should get quieter. Uh, the stimulation as a whole in the household should be, the activity choices should be calmer. You shouldn't be doing a lot of major physical activity. Doing obstacle courses and jumping around and rolling, those should be done earlier in the day. Um, have a very conscious routine at night that incorporates, you can still exaggerate the sensory input, but the deep pressure, you wanna do more deep pressure at night because for most people, that's gonna be more calming. 
and the movement is going to be calming, um, if that helps. Do more of the excitatory things earlier in the day. Okay, um, we're almost, our time is almost up, but I have one last question because this is also one of the most asked question is gadgets, tablets, and all those cell phones um, affecting the sensory issues of our kids? That's a tough one because I like technology, but I, I am observing how it's affecting my nervous system and even our thinking. And um, I've got some concerns and yet the addiction quality is so high. I mean, just we're on a tablet right now. There's so much that we can do on these tablets, um, but it's a concern. So with the sensory systems, think the natural. Um, go out and do physical play. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I, that's something I could maybe do a whole demo on um, is about these tablets versus going out and just doing some movement. Um, that should be part of the, the routine. Um, that should be part of the sensory diet routine. And it seems like we've kind of gotten away from saying no to our kids. Yeah. Our life has structure and it has boundaries. And I think that that's what adults, so much of what adults need to do is to teach about boundaries and to teach about right and wrong and yes and no. Um, we do need to say no. And when our child fights you on that, what do we do? Do we ignore it to the point where the child keeps saying, mommy, 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 I want this. We need to get healthy about that. And, you know, I have this general philosophy, like three strikes, you're out, you know, we're done. And so um, we need to have healthy rules, I think, about the iPad and be consistent. That's one of the most important things. Be consistent. Whatever you say, follow through on it or don't say it at all. And that's one of the biggest pieces of advice I have learned. And that was a psychiatric hospital. And give choices. You know, you can do this or this. But then the child's going to be like, but I want to do that. He's testing you. He's testing you. I said, no, this or this. And if you're consistent, your child will learn that you mean what you say. And it is about teaching respect. So figure out what's going to work in your household. And there should be some limits to that. And your child should know what those limits are and not fight you. And when you, they are fighting you, it's more often than not, I'm sorry, it's probably because you need to be more consistent as a parent. And I know that that's hard, but you know, try even try little bits, experiment with that. Give two choices, not three, and stick with it. And eventually your child should learn to, to respect that you mean what you say. And I think that that's really the, the bigger issue is the structure around the discipline on the iPads. Um, because I think that there can be some good things, but if you can do things where they're moving and physical and have hands-on manipulatives rather than a flat two-dimensional screen, you're gonna get so much more out of that. I, I um, had a thought the other day about meditation apps and all and why they can might be helpful it's kind of a dumbing down. It's, you know, let's do more natural things with one another rather than staying on the iPad all the time. That's why I'm talking about it. It's true. And it's, I think it's really just harder in the beginning, but as you become really consistent, me personally, from my experience, it's easier. It's more, much, much easier once everything is set, the rule is set, the boundaries is set, Life is much, much easier for me. That's right. But you got to do that upfront work, <laughs> you know, yeah. set up a plan. And, and that's where therapy and support comes in, professionals, you know, to go to a therapist and, and have that, that um, expertise help you through that so you can set that up and then, and then play with it and see what works and what doesn't and go back and say, I need help. This isn't working or this is working. And, and then you may find your child is making progress and the, it does need to be refined. 
That's it, good. <laughs> very much true. <laughs> I remember when uh, we had this um, consultation with a therapist, with the therapist of my son, and that's really just the only time that I was convinced that I was convinced that I really need to limit my son's gadget usage. That's the only time. And that therapist really helped me with that. And uh, I'm just, okay, thank you, Lord, for that. And now he has very limited time with gadgets already. So I think there's really a lot of things that needs to be talked about. But I think you will have a second, you know, a second um, session with us, Teacher Laura, because <laughs> there's a lot of things needs to be to be talk about. So before, yeah, and it and it's it's been frustrating from my standpoint too because I have all this information, and I know that I know your parents are out there, and it's like how do we connect? And so I've offered this free stuff. And, and I want to make a living and, and I'm having trouble and it's really weird. Um, and now we've had this pandemic. So that's why it's like, let me know how I can be of service to you all. I've come up with what I think uh, could be helpful to you all. And I do have some paid groups. Um, and of course you guys are halfway around the world. Um, but you know, is to like I, I guess I mentioned earlier about parents coming together, and I can offer the sensory piece, and then you can give me the feedback about what you're having the trouble with, and that's what's kind of driving my topic choices for my live demos. Um, you know, so hopefully those are helpful at least. Thank you so much, Teacher Laura. Actually, that's why I really invite you to grace us with this uh, training with the parents because I have seen uh, some of your comments in our uh, parents' mm -hmm. posts and questions and inquiries. And I really like those people who are really taking time, the, those professionals mm -hmm. who are really taking time to answer our questions. And uh, you're giving lots of free stuff already, actually, in your, in your YouTube channel, teaching parents how to do things. And all parents, you just have to go and visit that channel because she's really teaching lots of things on how to really uh, help our kids at home. So for most of us, um, we're, we're going to end up in prayer. We, rec we always recognize here in the support group that we can always apply science, but the best thing when we pray, it's God who's working with our kids. We can always work. Our therapists can always work with us, with our kids. But when we pray, it is God who's working with our kids. So can we just uh, pause and have a short prayer for just for now, let's pray. Okay. Um, Lord Jesus, thank you so much that uh, you are our Savior, you are our Lord, and we thank you that you have come here to give us life and have abundant life. And one of them is really to have um, wonderful connections with our kids. Lord, I pray for every parent who's joining me right now that may you give us wisdom, give us strength, no, uh, thank you for the knowledge that teacher Laura has given us today so that we can be able to have some sensory inputs to our kids and to be able to think of our routines and be able to change some of the things that's really not should be there. Help us, Lord. Give us, give us wisdom, us parents, oh God. And we fully depend on you. We know that this is really very hard if you're not with us so we thank you we receive you as our partner and as our help in this journey in this autism journey that we have as a family and th thank you for teacher laura i we um i pray that may you bless her help her with with all that these new things that you're doing in her life with all the parents coaching and teachings that she's doing help her lord and uh, bless her Bless her and provide for all her needs and her family's needs. We just uh, love you and thank you for everything. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, Teacher Laura, last words for the parents before we end. <laughs> for once, I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't have any last words. <laughs> just, you know, trust, 
tr- you know, seek help if you need it and, and, and play and be, you know, be creative, you know, and that there's a lot of people out there that are experiencing a lot of suffering as well. So you're not unique. <laughs> you're not unique. Thank you. But so the much. more you can go natural, <laughs> the more you can go natural and keep it simple. So you're welcome. Thank you for this opportunity. And I care for you all. You're deep in my heart, you know, so whatever I can do to help you all out, let me know. Yes. Thank you so much, Teacher Laura. And we're looking forward to the next sessions that we're going to have here, (laughs) hopefully soon. So thank you, parents. Thank you for joining us. And uh, if you have been blessed and helped with this video, just uh, I will post the recorded one maybe later. So thank you for joining us and have a good and blessed day. God bless. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank thank you, teacher. Wait, wait, wait. Bye.